little bit early, but since everybody's already in their seats and they're ready, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for coming this afternoon. Um, glorious day, and hopefully a, a very memorable day for everybody. I would now like to ask the Junior ROTC to do the flag presentation. Please stand. Go, y'all. Guys, 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 like to ask Joseph Rumball to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lee Mason and Kingwin Evans come up and sing the national anthem. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free And the home of the brave Order! Come! Now I'd like to invite Reverend Father Thomas Gallagher to come up and give us our invocation. God, our Father, we thank you for this day. We ask that as we gather to remember John Johnny Brumbaugh, our brother, our friend, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit down upon us, that we may know of your presence and Johnny's presence among us. Hear these, our prayers, through Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'd like to take a moment to recognize some of the dignitaries that are here. Delegate Michael Hornby, Delegate William Rodnar, and also Commissioner Steve Catlett. Thank you very much for coming.
House Concurrent Resolution 25 by Delegates Height, Hardy, Hornby, Hurst, Reynolds, Riley, Hanna, Ridenauer, Espinosa, Maynard, and Garcia. Requesting the Division of Highways name bridge number 017.48 eastbound and westbound, locally known as the Peckin Creek Bridge, eastbound and westbound, carrying West Virginia 9 over a Peckin Creek in Berkeley County, the U.S. Marine Corps, PFC John Lewis, Johnny Brumball Jr. Memorial Bridge. Whereas John Lewis, Johnny Brumball was born July 27, 1949, the son of John Lewis Brumball Sr. and Edna May Brumball in Martinsburg, Berkeley County, West Virginia. And whereas PFC John Lewis, Johnny Brumball Jr. enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and started a tour in South Vietnam on February 16, 1969 as a rifleman in A Company 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division. Whereas on February 23rd, 1969, U.S. Marine Corps PFC Johnny Lewis, John Lewis, Johnny Brumball Jr. was killed in action in Quang Nam Province, South Vietnam by enemy fire. And whereas it is fitting that an enduring memorial be established to commemorate U.S. Marine PFC John Lewis, Johnny Brumball Jr. and his contributions and ultimate sacrifice to our state and country, therefore be it resolved by the leg legislature of West Virginia that the Division of Highways is hereby requested to name said bridge in Berkeley County, the United States Marine Corps PFC John Lewis Johnny Brumball Jr. Memorial Bridge and be it further resolved that the Division of Highways is hereby requested to have made and be placed signs identifying the bridge as the U.S. Marine Corps PFC John Lewis Johnny Brumball Jr. Memorial Bridge and be it further resolved that the Clerk of the House forward a copy of this resolution to the Commissioner of the Division of Highways, Stephen J. Harrison, Clerk of the House of Delegates and keeper of the roles of the legislature. Thank you all. Uh, the day that this resolution was presented, I made some comments some uh, regarding uh, PFC Brumbaugh, Johnny Brumbaugh, and what he and his fellow Marines went through during the time that they were engaged. Uh, I had not had an opportunity to do a lot of research. I didn't have the materials that I usually have when I try to do uh, research on, on combat actions that U.S. forces participated in. So I did not do a particularly good job. I will read to you that resolution or my comments on that resolution and then provide some additional comments uh, based upon some more research I've been able to do. These are the comments. Mr. Speaker, I would like our delegates to know that Private First Class Brumbaugh was killed after being in Vietnam for only seven days. His unit, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, was defending an area south of Da Nang Air Base when he was killed in vicious fighting on the first day of, Nor of the North Vietnamese 1969 Tet Offensive. This was a year after the more famous 1968 Tet Offensive and was a continuation of that difficult war. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What I've been able to learn since then is that PFC Brumbaugh, with his company, was likely defending an area uh, around Anwa Marine Corps Combat Base uh, that in, as part of an operation, Taylor Common, that had started in December. That operation finished up in March. There were 183 uh, U.S. Marines killed during that operation, 100 South Vietnamese troops, and probably 1,300 to 1,400 North Vietnamese troops. They were defending against the North Vietnamese attack uh, on Anwa base, uh, combat base at the time. Um, they were probably engaged in vicious combat as I stated in my comments, uh, and this probably involved, as, as I've read, hand-to-hand -hand combat, which against these types of troops, uh, there is no quarter uh, for either side. You don't surrender in the middle of this. This was an operation where uh, we were out trying to destroy uh, a North Vietnamese force that was trying to seize the entire Quang Nam uh, and Da Nang area, uh, and this was a, a, a very important operation. And, helped seal the fate of operations against this area in Quang Nam up until the end of the war. Uh, as a Marine, 
as a retired Marine. I've spent uh, much of my life studying the war in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. I know why we were there. I, I've studied this for years, uh, and I have a very good understanding of how uh, the, op the war developed, uh, what happened, and how it ended. My wife is from Thailand. My daughter-in-law is the daughter of a is a daughter of a Vietnamese refugee who, excuse me, who lost her entire family in the war. I know that the reason that my wife, my daughter-in-law, and my great baby granddaughter are alive is because of individuals like PFC Brumbaugh and the other Marines, South Vietnamese troops, soldiers, Navy uh, personnel, Air Force uh, pilots and personnel who fought in Southeast Asia to defend us so that we can enjoy the liberties that we have today. It's due to their selfless sacrifice that we have the liberties we have uh, and that we hope that we can preserve in the future. And it is an honor for me to be able to talk to you about what PFC Brumbaugh did today. Thank you very much. I'd like now to invite County Councilman Steve Catlett to come up. Thank you, Michael. Soon, uh, July 1st, to be commissioner again, so I'm <laughs> looking forward to that. I uh, just probably asked to speak today because I've been so close to this family, it's unbelievable over the years. And, uh, Johnny was born in 49, I was born in 53, so I was four years younger. But Joe and I were a lot closer. We played ball against each other, and I've known Joe for a long time. And, uh, and um, you know, um, I never served in the war, never served in the military. And I was in college during this time. Um, well, I graduated from high school in 71 and went to college. But I, I had my draft number, but I avoided the uh, draft. I didn't, I didn't get chosen, I didn't get called. And because I was a few years younger, probably, but I had a lot of friends uh, from the Hedgesville area that served in Vietnam. Um, none passed away during the war, but um, it changed their lives when they came back to Hedgesville, I can tell you that. And um, it was very uh, dramatic in their life. And um, I, uh, what they went through was uh, unbelievable. Um, I've been really close to this family because of uh, Johnny's parents, and uh, I would uh, like to speak about them for a second because I had great respect for both of them. Uh, John Lewis Broomball Sr. was known as Dubber, and uh, when I was a kid uh, in the late 50s, six, seven years old, in the early 60s, uh, late 50s, I would go with my dad in a 1940 Plymouth, we'd ride into, uh, the field at that time was right where the Moose is today. And then it moved up to where Lambert Park is today. But they, fast pitch softball was the thing back then. And, um, you know, the slow pitch thing, they didn't have it then, you know, it was all fast pitch. It was real softball is what I'm trying to say. Frank, Frank Farmer knows what I'm talking about. And, uh, anybody can hit a slow pitch, but the fast pitch was a different world. But the, and of course, my dad was a pitcher. And almost every game, the plate umpire was Dubber Brumbo. <laughs> and he was the best umpire. I talked to my Uncle Gail over the weekend, because uh, he was in college at uh, West Virginia University at the time. He'd come home in the summers, and he played in this fast pitch softball league. So we to he told me stories about Dubber and him and umpire, but what great respect they had for him, because he was the best umpire in the league. Uh, characters like Bud Manick, Joe Yurish. Oh, Joe would be playing second base every game, and Dubber would make a call he didn't like, and Joe would come in like this from second base, stomped all the way in about halfway to home plate, busting at him. And he let it go the first time, but the second time he threw him out of the game, so uh, he couldn't take it anymore. But uh, 
he was a uh, awesome individual and of course he served during World War II and that's how he met Ed and May and uh, now, now let me tell you about Ed and May <laughs> do we have enough time oh, yeah. <laughs> you know I, I knew uh, Dubber long before I knew Ed and May because of the umpire and when I was a kid growing up and all that and I was at every game they played and the whole shebang and uh, <coughs> But I first started to know it back in 1987 was when War Memorial Park was turned over to the city of Martinsburg. And in, in, in that respect, it was then given over to Parks and Rec to maintain and operate War Memorial Park. And of course, at War Memorial Park, each year there was a Memorial Day program. And during the Memorial Day program, it was a very important part of the program was to have the Gold Star Mother lay the wreath on the memorial. And from 1987 until her passing in 2007, she was there every year as the Gold Star Mother for Berkeley County. I, I stopped by the park today on the way here, and I realized uh, that there were 15 individuals from Berkeley County on the memorial there. And of course, Johnny was uh, one of those 15. You know, I, I never appreciated uh, the sacrifice that these people made because I never served. But once I started working the park at War Memorial and was there every year for Veterans Day and, Memor uh, and Memorial Day and saw what it meant to the families of those individuals that gave the ultimate sacrifice, uh, it, it changed my whole perspective on our freedom. And I started appreciating myself, our freedom more than I did before, you know. Um, and I, I can't say enough about that. Uh, you know, Edna, her first husband was killed in the World War II. And then she gives up a 19-year-old son in the Vietnam War. And I, I don't know what sacrifice she had to make, but it seems like she was asked to do an awful lot in her life. And uh, but w what a great personality, what a great lady. When you were around her, you felt good. You, you felt like, you, you know, she 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 was the nicest lady and talked my last because she talked. She can now talk all these daughters uh, total. Uh, that's hard to believe, but uh, but how fascinating was she and how entertaining was she? It was unbelievable. So, uh, you know, over the years at Parks and Rec, uh, you know, her family, uh, Edna and Glenn Miller and Angel, uh, Carol and Doug Mason. Their kids, Douglas, John, David, and Erica, you know, all participated in our parks and rec. Doug officiated soccer, basketball for us for years, and the kids were all involved. Erica lifeguarded and managed our pools there. Uh, Vicki and Vic Carter, uh, JC and Steve Kimes. JC was the greatest rec league soccer player of all time. <laughs> Where are you, JC? Hey, hey, hey. If you don't believe me, just ask him. him. <laughs> Let's go hold my thing, Steve. Thanks. <laughs> Son, uh, Joe, I talked about Joe, and uh, we played ball up the pike side against each other. And, uh, who, who won the most games against each other, Joe? I, don't, I think we did. I don't Depends know. on who the umpire was. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Dumper wasn't the umpire, so <laughs> we, we had a chance. And, so, uh, and then, of course, uh, Mike Height and Jimmy Schaffner uh, officiate for us at Parks and Rec over the years. Their kids are always involved in uh, some of Edna and Dubber's grandkids. And, uh, you know, it's just a great family. You know, in uh, Vietnam, uh, there was 58,200 U.S. soldiers at that day. And uh, in 73, when we left, uh, there's there's 15 of those from Berkeley County. Uh, you know, in the Korean War, pretty significant war, there's only 20 Berkeley Countyans that passed away. In World War II, there was 201 and then in World War One, there were 41. Um, but the ultimate sacrifice uh, was nothing greater than giving your life in service to the country. I was so glad that uh, Edna got to live to see the new memorial at War Memorial Park. Uh, in 2006, when she passed in 07, we built a new granite memorial in the center of the park up behind the bleachers so you could see it from the stage. And all those previous years, 19, 20 years, when she was the gold star mother, 
The memorial was over by the concession stand and restroom. And, and when she would walk over and lay the wreath, she was out of sight from everybody that, you know, was there to, to view. So we thought, we, we gotta move this thing and get it to a better place, and, and we did. And I'm so appreciative of the fact that she lived to be there that last year of her life when we dedicated that new memorial in 06. Of everything we did over the years at War Memorial Park, I'm talking about a new swimming pool, I'm talking about new pavilions, I'm talking about this and that. The thing that drew the most attention of anything we ever did in my history there, of working there, was the 06 Memorial, the Granite Memorial. And I would see family members come to that park during the week on weekdays. Didn't have to be a holiday, didn't have to be a weekend. And they would sit there on those granite benches and stare at that memorial for hours. And I tell you, it would, uh, it would shake your soul and it would get you to understand what sacrifice they meant. And I know they're honored now by the Vietnam Wall down in Washington, D.C. And I'm correct to say that John's name is there as well. So what a great honor and such a 19 year old to take his life at such an early age um, doesn't seem fair. And uh, I just think it's really special and I appreciate Mike and the legislature for honoring him today with this uh, Memorial Bridge. I think it's a wonderful thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to invite Carol Ann up for some remembrances now. Uh, I'm going to start, you know, I tried to think of and ask each one of my siblings about memories of Johnny, not through the years, but more towards the end of his life. And a couple of them said that the most, the thing that stood out the most was the last Christmas that we spent together. My youngest sister said that all she could remember, because she was so much younger, was him with his girlfriend, Jandy, and how important she was to the family at the time. To me, it was the fact that he died the year I turned 18 and was buried on my 18th birthday. And uh, I was a senior in high school that year. I met my husband through him, and uh, I'm going to start with a poem that I wrote during school instead of paying attention in class right after he passed away. And it says, sorrow and emptiness is all you see. It tears at your heart almost endlessly. You feel so sad, but know not why. You ask yourself, why did he die? Everyone must go, they all seem to say, but he was so young, and why today? He saw so little of life you know, I can't understand why he had to go. Oh, he's happier where he is right now. You'll get along without him somehow. At least he's away from all this strife. I'm glad he now enjoys a better life. He died in the service of his country, he gave up his life for you and me. He was the type to do his part, a real fighter from the very start. Was his death really a shame? Was it wasted time and pain? While riots, fights, and disorder reign, must men like Johnny die in vain? If the people of the country would really try, men like this wouldn't have to die. If we weren't so selfish and we thought of others, I wouldn't be missing my favorite brother. And now I say I wouldn't be missing one of my brothers. At that time, he was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> because I met my husband through it. <laughs> okay. John L. Brumbaugh Jr. was born July 27, 1949 at King's Daughters Hospital in Martinsburg. Johnny was right in the middle of our gang of seven children. Our parents were John L. Brumball, a lifelong resident of Martinsburg, and Edna Mae Kelly Brumball, a World War II war bride from England. Johnny's older siblings included a brother, James Joyce Brumball, deceased, two sisters, Doreen K. Brumball Schaffner, 
and Edna Marie Brumball Miller, a younger brother, Joseph Kelly Brumball, and two younger sisters, Carol Ann Brumball Mason and Vicki Lynn Brumball Carter. He was born while our family lived on Raleigh Street, right where the fire station is now located. However, he spent the rest of his life growing up in our home in Pikeside. Johnny attended and graduated from St. Joseph's Catholic School in Martinsburg in 1967. As a child, he played Little League Baseball as well as basketball in school. During those years, Pikeside was a tight-knit community of families with many children. We were the generation who ran free through the neighborhood, playing outside all day long. The only time you came inside was for a meal, if you heard your mother calling your name, or it was dark. Johnny was always a passive, non-aggressive child and followed the orders of his older, older sister, Edna, the general of our gang. <laughs> he went to work at Pikeside Golf Station while in high school and after graduation was employed by Lockheed Aircraft. This park and bridge hold many fond memories for our family. This park is where St. Joseph's Church used to hold their annual parish picnic every summer when we were young. We remember playing ball, having races, and playing in the creek. We also remember crossing the old Apecan Bridge every Sunday as we traveled to the VA Center as a family. We pushed patients to mass every week from the old domiciliary wards to the chapel. As many children of that age, Johnny was raised with a strong sense of faith and patriotism. When he became more aware of the war in Vietnam, he felt it his duty to enlist in the service. He chose the Marines and was soon sent to Paris Island and Camp Lejeune for his training. He came home from that training a young man, no longer a boy. It appeared he grew several inches and filled out to truly look like a soldier upon his return. Johnny was able to spend one last Christmas with our family before reporting to Camp Pendleton in Southern California. We received notification of his death before we were even aware that he had actually arrived in Vietnam. Johnny died on February 23, 1969 and was buried on March 11th, my 18th birthday. Like so many other young men, he died before his time. I think of the many childhood stories I could tell for hours of the fun we had as children. I would like to be able to tell you the stories of his life as he matured, but I draw a blank. I can't picture him at 25, 30, 40, or even 70. I draw a blank of what he would look like as an older man. He is forever the young 19-year-old brother we all miss even after all these 54 years that have passed. I would like to be able to tell you of all the great contributions he made to our community, how he went on to do great and ordinary things with his life. However, he died before he could marry his sweetheart, Jandy, who was waiting at home for his return. He died before he was able to become a father and an example for his children who were never born. He never became the Boy Scout leader, baseball or basketball coach, or the community volunteer with the different organizations in our town. He was never able to make worthwhile contributions to our community as an adult. Instead, he gave his life for our community and our country so that we would be able to enjoy the many freedoms that we take for granted. At a time like this, we should remember all the brave young men and women who fought and died for us. Remember those who suffered and continue to suffer the separation from family and loved ones, the fear and danger of battle, and of not knowing if they will return home at the end of their tour. This country is only as great as the people who give their life in service so that we may enjoy the lives that we have. Especially keep the thought, freedom isn't free. 
There is a cost to many for what we take for granted so many times. If you take nothing else with you today from this celebration, let it be to thank the veteran, soldier, policeman, fireman, or any first responder that you see for their many sacrifices. So let me close by reminding you, all give some, but some give all. I'd like to take this time to present the resolutions to each one of the siblings. And I'll come to you, because you all can come to me. <laughs> The, the sheriff's uh, deputy reserve they're here today to actually unveil on the highway itself and they'll be doing that uh, here in just a moment so you'll see that as we leave but we have the smaller hold it still hold it still towards me towards me towards me Slow down. <laughs> if you would turn them towards me, ladies. <laughs> turn them around. Turn them around. <laughs> Now it says closing remarks, and I, I'll tell you I struggled with this for quite a long time, because I didn't personally know Johnny. So, if I do nothing else in the legislature, this was enough. Thank you. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us pray. Give ear, O Lord, to our prayers and deign to bless this bridge and all who pass over it that, it, that they may be assisted by you in every prosperity and every adversity of their earthly sojourn. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Safe to send your holy angels from heaven to protect us, to assist us at and defend this bridge and all who pass over it. Through Christ our Lord, amen. 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 And we pray that Johnny may have the eternal beatific vision, the vision seeing God face to face. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. 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 May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks.